I'm here to conquer my fears by building a big dining table made from a single slab of wood and epoxy. Felt dirty just saying that, to be honest. Hopefully I can also settle the debate if this should even be considered actual woodworking. Now you might be wondering where here is. Having never built any fake rivers made of plastic myself, I decided to turn to the experts. And when all of them turned me down, I ended up at M2 Lumber run by my buddy, Matt Morgan. Thanks. To build a slab table, you need a slab. Now I could show you some generic montage of Matt and I pretending to pick something out, but the truth is we actually selected this about four months ago and he was kind enough to set it aside for me. But we did run into a couple issues as we looked at it today for the first time. John and I were talking and he's decided he doesn't want to do a traditional generic river table, which typically we would cut this right up the middle and just point the live edge facing inwards. I'm more into pond tables right now. So what we can do instead is find another piece and maybe pair along with it because this is only 24 to 28 inches wide and that'll help to use less epoxy and make it less generic. The other issue is that this is currently eight quarters, so about two inches in thickness, but it's lumpy. It is definitely not flat, which means we have no margin for error. Mess up and the table turns into a potato chip. Also, it's really heavy and John is pretty weak, so I'm definitely gonna have to help him carry this one. That's true. Jokes about my Skeletor body aside, one of my first observations about these slab tables is what a chore something as simple as moving pieces is. I have no clue how I'm going to finish this in my shop solo, but that's a problem for future John. So after trying a lot of different layouts here, mixing, matching, we've landed on something that we're pretty happy with overall. I do have to say that was a lot of work, a lot more than I was anticipating. Definitely not woodworking, but it was work. There are some issues though here, and we're gonna have to address that later on in the build. Now we are gonna end up with more epoxy than originally that I wanted. It's gonna start at the top and it's gonna continuously flow all the way down here. And it's gonna pool in what we're gonna call the bay area, but we are gonna trim off a nub from the top of this slab, put it here as our sandbar of sorts, and we'll leave this open and fill it with epoxy later on. I find it's good to get outside the comfort zone of your shop and build a project with other woodworkers from time to time. This helps confirm that you're not totally off base with your process, like taking multiple shallow passes while breaking down slabs. But the bonus is learning new tricks or better ways to complete a task. For instance, Matt is an expert at near decapitation while using his track saw. He is either a serial killer, or he genuinely thought it was funny that we were a couple inches away from me finishing this project solo. Fortunately, we did learn our lesson for the second slab. We should probably support this in. I think it's probably gonna go somewhere if we don't. <laughs> throwing that out there. I don't know why, I have a feeling. Before I get off on another tangent, I do wanna thank him for putting a pause on his business to help me out with this build. If you're near upstate South Carolina and you're looking for a fantastic sawmill that does things the right way, check out M2 Lumber. We also have a dedicated video about the ins and outs of buying from a small mill. And if you're not local, they just started shipping slabs anywhere in the country. Matt is also really good at helping me move things, which I'm quickly finding is 50% of epoxy table work. All right, so now we have John's big lumpy pecan slab up on the CNC machine. And now we're gonna be flattening the backside. We're doing the backside because that's what's gonna be going down inside of our epoxy mold. We wanna make sure that's flat enough so we can get a good seal around the perimeter to keep epoxy from running up underneath it. Another thing is because wood is not as dense as epoxy, it'll actually float in there. So we wanna be able to make sure we can keep out as much as we possibly can. You do have other options for flattening your slab. You could build a homemade router sled or you could take a belt sander to it for the next four years of your life, but I would highly recommend befriending someone with a CNC. Call this woodworking. Doesn't seem like woodworking. It's not bad though. All right, we've got a bit of a problem. This is getting a little too thin for our liking at this point in the build, so here's the plan. Yeah, so Humpty Dumpty is definitely not flat yet, but the important thing like we were going for is we have a nice flat zone here around the perimeter so we can put a lot of silicone and caulk around here. Ideally, we wouldn't have any epoxy running up underneath the slab. Now in this case, because we don't wanna go any thinner, we'll probably have that happen a little bit. It's better than taking the whole thing and making it too thin. And then again, this will be on the bottom side, so it won't be that evident. Not the worst, but not the best. Something else I'm starting to piece together, I can see why these tables are so expensive. Forget the labor aspect for a minute. 
It's all the additional costs that add up, like the melamine for the molds, the tape to make sure that it doesn't leak, and that's nothing compared to the epoxy, which seems like you're paying walnut board foot prices for plastic, not walnut. Doing a one-off project could sink you really quickly. I declare bankruptcy! Okay, you saw us struggling to put this big form onto the table here and then bring the slabs over into place. And now we need to address a couple things from earlier. The first being this overhang right here. Matt's gonna talk to the plan. So whenever you have a live edge slab that you're gonna trim to try to make it fit your project like we're doing now, I always advise to people to try to follow natural grain lines. And you can see here that the grain line comes around in this curved pattern where this crotch is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna trace that and just pick one in a close general shape and then we can cut that with our jigsaw at about a 30 degree angle which will also match the shape of the live edge. I've never done this before but that all sounded great. It'll be great. I am by no means an expert craftsman but I would consider myself slightly above average. What I love about woodworking is taking an idea, drawing it up and then creating exactly what you need. However, I'm finding with epoxy tables that's not how it works. You heard me mention during the intro about wanting to build this from a single slab, but that plan went out the window quickly, and selecting the final layout was a struggle. You only saw 20 seconds, but the reality was 30 minutes of frustration and FaceTime consultations. When you're building from dimensional lumber, it's very defined. You can dial in design details to very tight tolerances, but this is completely different. I'm not ready to say it's more art than woodworking, but I am gaining a different appreciation for starting with an organic shape. I want it to be perfect, but it won't be. And a friend who builds some of the best epoxy tables on YouTube told me, I've never had a slab that gave me a perfect layout. There is always compromise. So maybe that's a good lesson, not just for me, but anyone watching this video. Getting a slab ready for the actual pour is a lot of things. There are the highlights like debarking, which I found to be quite fun. And then there are the dull moments like using dental picks to clean up cracks and remove any loose debris. But fun or not, you need to do all of it to protect yourself if anything unexpected happens. When my wife and I welcomed two little humans into the world, we realized it was time to protect our future. God forbid anything should ever happen to one of us. Now, life insurance isn't fun to talk about. Like it's not fun cleaning out these bug galleries, but you need to do it. We've been using Policy Genius before my channel even existed. What our family likes about Policy Genius and why we selected them is the process. The company was built to modernize the life insurance industry and their technology makes it easy to compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks and find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Additionally, the agents are not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another. There are no added fees and all your information is kept private. I can truly tell you it's a pleasant experience. And if you don't believe me, check out the thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash Lincoln Street or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. And thank you to Policy Genius for sponsoring this video. It's the next day and our mold has had 24 hours to cure, but I hope you're picking up. This is not a full on instructional video. I mean, I've never even made an epoxy table before. I don't even know where to start on figuring out how much plastic we need for this. But there is one thing that Matt is above average at, and that's calculating the epoxy needed for a project like this because he has sold a lot of epoxy. So what is complicated about calculating the total volume of epoxy for a river table? Well, unfortunately, we don't usually have a nice uniform rectangular prism but that's exactly what we do to make it easier. There's a mathematical form where we can actually break down the length of this shape into small sections. In this case, I've chosen every five inches. And then in each of those sections, I'm going to measure the width and calculate the area of this tiny rectangle. I will then multiply times the depth of the epoxy we want to pour. And then I come up with a total volume, in this case, 850 cubic inches which is equivalent to about 13 liters of epoxy. For the folks at home that really wanted Matt to convert 13 liters like I did, according to Google, that's about four and a half gallons of epoxy. And quick spoiler alert, we use more, but you'll see why in a moment. Now this part of the project is definitely not art. I'm not even sure it's science, but I did learn a couple tricks like not accidentally adding air bubbles like I did there. 
and having a good Spotify playlist queued up because stirring for 5 minutes is quite boring. Although adding the dye was reasonably fun. And yes, there is no way I was doing anything but black for this project. All the other colors seem like they'll age about as well as a farmhouse table surrounded by shiplap walls. I bet the epoxy table veterans are screaming at their screens right now about us not sealing this slab with an initial flood coat. But we like to roll the dice on $3,000 tables. The truth is, this table still needs to be flattened on top, so any potential staining would be removed during that process. And as a bonus, Matt has already built a similar table from the same tree and didn't have any issues, so we're not too worried about it. Now, it was at this point I discovered the great pyramid scheme known as river tables. It's best to have a secondary project so you have a place to pour your leftover epoxy. But when that's not enough for the side piece, you end up mixing more and eventually you're stuck in a vortex of never-ending extra epoxy and slabs. It's actually quite brilliant on their part. And after an oddly satisfying process of popping air bubbles, we double-checked to confirm the mold was still level. And while I was hoping for a leak to add some drama to this video, no such luck. It was perfect. It's been two weeks and this has had a chance to fully cure up, but it's time to do the thing I have been dreading most about this entire project, taking this out of the mold. It'll be fine. Or it could be a complete disaster. After watching countless epoxy videos over the years, I was convinced this process would take hours. The table was likely to stick to the bottom of the mold and chaos would ensue. My YouTube observation is everyone seems to have their own magic formula for slab removal. But Matt and I decided to call in a favor from our old friend Physics and use the overhang of the melamine to our advantage. After that, we smashed in some wooden wedges. Look, I'm trying to connect woodworking dots here. I, I get it, it's a reach, but I'm doing my best. Now, maybe it was all the prep work we did up front or perhaps it was just dumb luck. Regardless, this went from something I was nervous about to an easy and dare I say, enjoyable part of the build. Oh yeah, we have a table, got it. I knew epoxy contracts while it's curing, but I guess I never had that come into play when I'm using it, because we lost about an eighth of an inch and are now teetering on the verge of the final table being too thin. And you might be looking at this shot thinking, they are screwed, but it's only half as bad as it looks. I'll let in the moment John do a better job of explaining why. We knew going in that there were going to be challenges retaining the thickness of the table. So you can see here that the CNC didn't work its way all the way down for the epoxy in the bay area and then into the tributary. That's because we're at an inch and a half right now. So to combat that, we're going to do a secondary epoxy pour here and over in this area. And then tomorrow we'll go back and we'll flatten it one last time. And that'll prevent the high tide, low tide situation on the table. I blame global warming. Other than this fly deciding to off itself in the epoxy, our plan worked out swimmingly. Now I'm actually building this table for my parents and it's a bit of a funny story because I'm not sure my mom even wants a new table. She's rather attached to the current one that they've been schlepping around for over 30 years. Like the paintings I did in elementary school. Oh yeah, still framed. But as a bit of a teaser for later in the video, her wish may just come true and she can keep that original table after all. I'm starting to form an overall opinion on big slab tables and doing my best to come up with an answer to my question if this should be considered actual woodworking. I think I could make a case for or against it at this point, but I do want to see the process all the way through before letting you know my final thoughts. What I can say is having Matt cut out the recess spots for the C channel without me having to pick up a router is convenient, but it does feel like cheating. Now a CNC is definitely not mandatory for building these behemoths, but a rotary sander is. Vestal has the Rotex, Makita and Bosch also make something comparable, and from my understanding they are just as good. But the point is, I can see where you would recoup your investment on the first project in time saved. They are much more powerful than a random orbital sander, and even with this extra juice, I still spent two and a half hours removing the tracks from the flattening bit. I decided to turn into a squirrel and eat snacks because it was taking so long. We finally reached the point where Matt could let this little bird fly out of the nest and try his hardest not to screw up the hours upon hours and thousands of dollars of pecan and plastic. Friendships were sown, memories were made, and with the big slab back at my shop, the only thing left to do was say our sad farewells. Thank God, Jesus. Well, I do miss that lovely mustache. It's nice being back in my shop, especially having the project manager around. You will notice there are some big blobs of epoxy on the underside of the table. In keeping with the oceanic theme, let's just call them tidal pools. 
Really, it's a byproduct of trying to maintain the thickness and prevent our potato chip nightmare. It's not ideal, but since I'm not selling this piece, it's not worth taking the time to fix it, in my opinion. What I can't live with are these streams of silicon that are trapped underneath the epoxy. Those need to go. Now, this is well outside my standard playbook, but I'm thinking maybe a Dremel might get the job done. We'll see how that goes. I think it's actually working. This is exciting. I'm excited. After I finish cleaning up the streams, I can fill those and any other air bubbles with what is hopefully my last epoxy encounter for quite some time. I'm sparing you the pain of watching all the sanding I did on the bottom of this table, but it was absolutely brutal. If you've never worked with pecan before, it just so happens to be one of the hardest domestic woods you can find in North America. To make it even worse, there are lots of knots and swirly sections that are basically big swaths of end grain where there shouldn't be end grain. I'll let you know later in this video how many hours I spent prepping this table for finish. Your hint, it was a lot. To avoid having to flip this table over multiple times, I decided to drill in my threaded inserts for the metal base now. I keep forgetting to buy one of those guides that turns your drill into a drill press, so until then a scrap piece of wood helps get the hole started reasonably close to perpendicular. Stop! Time out. I just had a thought. Well, actually, Future John had a thought, but the timelines aren't at all important. Remember I mentioned earlier that this build is replacing my parents' old table? For some reason, my mom likes that thing, so what if I can somehow repurpose the base? Now, the only problem is it's too small. However, I do have a shop full of woodworking tools, so let's see what happens. Before people get all ornery in the comments section about me destroying this cool looking piece, let me give you some actual facts. Yes, it was made in Denmark. Yes, it has a teak plywood top. And yes, in its heyday was a very nice piece of furniture. However, it still came from a factory, it's not custom made, the teak veneer has been burned through, and at one point in time, a dog used the feet as a chew toy. It's in rough shape. In fact, it was two days away from being listed for $50 on Facebook Marketplace. The main challenge is the profile on the bottom stretcher. That was made by a shaper. I don't have one of those, but I do have a table saw for starters. After I remove the bulk of the material, I can break out the hand planes and start shaping this to match the existing piece. What's that? You're surprised this dummy can use a hand plane? Me too. I bounce back and forth between a jack plane for bulk removal and then a block plane for refinement. Maybe I was yearning to do some actual woodworking after drowning in plastic for a week, but I thoroughly enjoyed that process. I mean, can't you tell by the smile? Now you might be asking if I ran this by my mom and dad. Short answer, yes. Ish. I just told them I had a plan and they would like it. But they did already buy a metal base that they were really excited about. Since they tend to be nice and say they like everything I do, I know you guys will give me real feedback and at the end of the video, I'll show the table with both bases and you can tell me if I completely wasted my time or not. There was a two and a half inch apron on the original piece. Without it, the top is too low. So I glued up more sapili and cut it to size. Additionally, I wanted to add a top stretcher to give this more stability. I know none of this is going to be as perfect as starting from scratch, but I'm doing my best to make it look cohesive and thought out. I suppose the smart thing to do would have been modeling this in SketchUp, but for some reason in my head, I thought it would all work. There was a nice round over on part of that original trestle, so I marked where it stopped and started to have it match the new supplemental pieces and turn it into something more purposeful looking. I know there are still going to be people angry about upcycling a piece from the 1960s, but I'm hoping it works and part of the original table can live on with our family for another 30 years. I'm not being cheeky here, this is real time and I have no clue how it turns out because I just dropped the base off with a finisher this morning to have it sprayed with tinted lacquer. Look, I know my limitations. But now we can go back to where I so rudely interrupted myself and have a laugh as past John tries to flip over the top. Oh my god, it's heavy. Holy shit. Look at him, like a malnourished Gumby. There you go, hernia. I don't know why I possibly thought I was done with epoxy because tables have two sides. And the problem with the top, there are a lot more holes, checks, and cracks than there were on the bottom. I guess because most of it was covered up by our tidal pools. On the bottom, I used hot glue to try and keep the epoxy in place. There's just way too many here for me to do that. I would 
spend the next two days of my life. I'm gonna try something a little different and syringe it in for precision. Hopefully there's less overfill. I don't even know if that's a thing. I feel like I saw it on the internet once, but we'll see how it goes. Call it sand and procrastination, but we need to have an honest conversation about flatness. When this came off the CNC, it was perfect, like flat earth flat, but temperature has a dramatic effect on wood and epoxy. When it got really hot in Matt's shop, the table developed a very big cup. But as it's cooled down, it's acclimated to my garage, it's straightened out, and in the worst spots, we're looking at about a sixteenth of an inch. Honestly, it's probably less than that. Don't worry about chasing perfection. It's an organic medium. I guess in this case, it's organic-ish. Like all those fake farm-to-table restaurants, but you get the point. All right, I need to get back to sanding. I didn't do an official count, but I'm guessing there were over 100 epoxy blobs to clean up. So I decided to go old school and use a card scraper, which is such an underrated tool if you can get a proper burr established. Once you do, instead of sawdust, you get these nice fluffy shavings. But there's a downside, because as the great Roy Underhill says, you gotta put your ass into it. It's a lot of work, and soon enough, my fingers hurt. To give my dainty thumbs a break, I bounce back and forth between the sander and card scraper. And here's a quick pro tip I learned on this project. The 310W sandpaper by 3M is much better at cleaning up epoxy blobs than its much more expensive brother, the 710W, everyone knows as Cubitron, because there is less surface area. So while it cuts a little slower, it actually ends up cutting faster after a minute or so because it doesn't clog up the disc. If you want to up your finishing game, you need to sand in the dark with a raking light. It highlights all the imperfections. For instance, this part of the table looks fine, but turn off the overheads and flip on the raking light, and you can see these punky wormholes that would have otherwise been completely missed, which means you'll be redoing a good chunk of the sanding process. There are cheap photography wands online. Honestly, use whatever. Turn on spooky stories if you want to embrace the moment, and I assure you that you won't miss sanding swirls or little knot holes going forward. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Prepping an 8-foot table made from one of the hardest woods you can source locally in North America sucks. After it was all said and done between sanding, pouring, more sanding, and then cleaning up micro bubbles with CA glue, I had invested over 30 hours of labor into getting this table prepped for finish. 30 hours! Yes, this is an extreme case because of the nature of these slabs, but regardless, it's a process. Thankfully, the most enjoyable part of the entire build follows those dark and lonely times. If you follow me on Instagram, you know that I've been working on a finishing video testing 10 of the most popular hard wax oils. So you might be saying, he's giving us the results before publishing, but I'm not. I'll be working on that video while this table cures for a couple weeks. But I did go with Osmo because I personally love the way it looks on lighter colored woods. Did I pick the wrong one? I don't know. I'll find out next week. Should I have done this test before? You bet, but I never claim to be smart. Stay tuned for that video, it's really gonna be a good one. First coat's done, and I can apply the next one tomorrow, or so I thought. Okay, I've got a bit of a good news, bad news situation. The good news is this first coat looks really good. I'm very pleased with it. The bad news is we've developed a scratch here somewhere along the finishing process. Now it's not terribly noticeable when the light hits it just right, you can see it. The nice thing is hard wax oils spot repair very easily. So I do need to sand this all the way back down to bare wood, reapply finish in this area, and it will blend in very nicely. It's not ideal because it's going to take me a couple hours, but it's the right thing to do. So should epoxy tables be considered actual woodworking? If your idea of traditional woodworking involves a heavy dose of hand or power tools to mill, size, and fit objects together to build furniture of some sorts, you're going to miss a lot of those aspects if you decide to take a float down these plastic rivers. But humor me for a moment. What if the question was wrong to begin with? Because I agree that fitting a dado isn't the same as calculating how much resin you need for a pour. Instead, what if the question we should all be asking is, should epoxy tables be considered making? And my conclusion after all the time invested on this project is yes. You start with a raw material and after countless hours of labor and refinement, you end up with a tangible finished product. This isn't me announcing a pivot of the channel. In fact, I don't see myself doing another build like this for quite some time. But I have a new perspective and I would encourage anyone that snubbed their nose, like I did in the past, to rethink your stance and be supportive of keeping the maker movement alive.
And now, the moment so many of you have been waiting for, telling me I'm wrong and giving your opinion. Base option number one. I purchased this off Etsy from West Coast Design Decor. I'll leave a link below, and the quality is really nice, I'm actually quite pleased with it. I'm sure you've seen this design before, it's known as a spider base, and it's quite modern and cool looking, it really fits this top, and like I said earlier, was the original plan until option number two. Remember what this looked like before? Well, it's been given a new life after some hand plane elbow grease and an incredible finishing job from Chris over at Broken Oak Restoration. Dog chew spots? I don't know what you're talking about. A new stretcher? Sure looks original to me. Hey, John. Hey, I just texted over a couple pictures of the bases. I'm trying to wrap this video up. Can you let me know which one you like? Yeah, sure. Actually, I like them both. I know, me too. Sadly, your table can only have one base, though. Well, I really like... Wait a minute. Did you take apart my favorite table? Jonathan!